So, Stalin comes to the London Naval Treaty. Oh my lord. Okay, so... In simple phraseology, when I was first recording this, and first putting this together, I was thinking a lot about the various positions that could have happened. Simple point. The odds are, if Stalin came to the London Naval Treaty in 1930, if Stalin brought the so and the Soviets came and they came in, there were various positions of what they would want. There is a overwhelming, overwhelming scenario of the treaty system breaks down entirely. That's the overwhelmingly likely response, because... The conditions for the various powers to accept what would be the likely requirements of the Soviets wanting to be in it are such that they would be intolerable to several of them. Saying that, though, what happens if it doesn't? What's the circumstance? What's the very thin, narrow line that it actually comes about and a treaty could actually be agreed. And this was the challenge when I was set this question by Patreon. I really took as a challenge of how could I make this work? And I'm re-recording this video now because I've just done a video. Actually, I just recorded a few minutes ago and finished lo loading it on Britain's forgotten lost generation of battleships. From the battleships they were researching in the run up to the 1930s. Then run up to 1930. When the Washington Treaty was going to fall apart. Was supposed to end. And realistically. What that gave me. When I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about that during this live. Was that you are dealing with a very complicated scenario. When it comes to it. When if you have... The Soviet Union, Stalin, and his dictatorship. A, you increase the dictatorships at the treaty discussions by 100%. Because Mussolini's there. Italy. You increase the authoritarian regimes there by 50%. Because let's be honest, Japan is not a dictatorship but it's also not a uh, it's authoritarian we'll go we'll go with that there are many many ways you can describe and talking about the Japan political system and leadership system is an entire video of itself so please note when i describe it as authoritarian i realize it is not a perfect description but for the benefits of this video not turning into an entire video discussing the nature of japanese government Please allow me to go with something which will provide most viewers who are who have not done, uh, gone off and done a minor degree in the Japanese governments or systems of the 1920s and 30s an approximation of what you're talking about. It's an authoritarianish regime. It would increase those present by 50%. You'd have both Japan and Italy and now the Soviet Union, which would mean you would have free democracies, one of which you can argue about how well it's functioning, that is France, at this point, and free authoritarian regimes. You also have the effects of the Great Depression and all the, fin all the financial issues that are going through those countries at the time. You add all that in, you get a very heady mixture. You get an incredibly heady mixture. <clears throat> of circumstance, really. And as I'll be discussing, Stalin coming in is not going to make anything easier. He is really not going to make anything easier. In fact, more than likely, he's going to make it a lot more difficult. I'm also going to introduce you to a range of characters who've been discussed elsewhere on this channel. There is going to be some of the Soviet Naval Chiefs of Staff from this period, and we're going to be discussing them. They don't get a lot of discussions, but 
I did a whole series a couple of Christmases back on the development of the Soviet Navy and its history. And I did go into its chiefs of staff and their various roles and what they brought to the Navy. So there is going to be a lot of that discussed because each of them has an impact on the Navy. It's also going to be a discussion of Maxim Lit Litvinov, who is most famous as the Russian ambassador to the United States between 1941 and 1943, but who in this period, and that's the important thing, in this period was the People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union, a post he served in from July 1930 to May 1939. Now again, that means he's slightly late for this treaty, but I reckon it's more likely him that would be sent to be the eminence, to be the person that Stalin would want representing him at this treaty than his predecessor, uh, Georgi Chirin, uh, Chirin, who is... How do I put this politely? He's trusted to an extent, but he's not as trusted as Litvinov to deliver what Stalin wants. He is far more of, I would argue, a career diplomat. He's far more of a um, interesting personality. He also has some <clears throat> history which made Stalin not particularly keen on him. And Stalin knew. Stalin knew all his people's history. He made it his his absolute raison d'etre to know every piece of potential blackmail and black mark against their name that he could use if he needed to. It only turned into red marks when he wanted to kill once he'd gone. A black mark until you at your name until he decided to send for the lead delivery. Shameless book plug. I do this in every video. I do this in every video because I like it. It's a good book. I enjoy it. And there are more coming. But this is the one I have out now. And there is a link down below to a competition. There is also a link down below to the Amazon site where you can go and find a copy if you don't think you can win the competition. But if you're interested in it. All procurement is greatly received because, let's be honest, I'm an academic. My entire career promotion is based on how many books I sell, not anything else. It's the way of life. So let's start off with some background, shall we? Before we get into the Soviets turning up at the 1930 London Naval Treaty, first of all, we have to work out what they would want when they turned up and what kind of state are they in when they do. Now, I will give you this point. If the Soviets choose to invest in the Navy, and there is possibilities here in this scenario, they would, they would be expecting them to be investing earlier in the Navy than they did historically, that means they're not going to invest in something else. If they make this, and I'll be talking about this, there are various projects they could do to make this uh, push this forward. If they make this an emphasized campaign, something they're really concertedly working towards, it's going to affect other things. However, and I will say this, import, uh, this with as much care as I can. The fact is, the Soviets have a lot of targets for their five-year plans. I don't think they ever achieve a single one of them. Not honestly. Not actually. Not if you're looking at the accurate data and the same metrics they claim to. It, there is a lot of lying, because let's be honest, if you fail to deliver on the targets you have, your life expectancy is directly proportional to how quickly the guards can enter the room. Okay, it's not quite that bad, but it's, it's getting on close. Reporting failure up in the Soviet Union, you had better have a good es scapegoat below you to blame it on. Uh, it's not something you really want to do. So... This leads to some colourful interpretation of the results of some of their figures. Which then gets covered up in a whole load of propaganda, both interpersonal propaganda, internal propaganda, and external propaganda, actually. So it's not both, it's all three. And interpersonal propaganda is a comp competition between the various ministries for who can deliver on Stalin's vision better. And within the ministries... 
of in the positions. Who can deliver on the vision of the great leader better? Oh, yeah, that there is there is no good system. So, because of the success of the first plan, Stalin forged ahead with the second five-year plan in 1932. Uh, this is he, but this is because he declares the five-year plan, the first five years, has succeeded early. It would employ a carrot as well as a stick methodology, uh, including child care to enable mothers to be deployed in the workforce. All sorts of lovely things. Basically, the idea was we've got to maximize the working capability of our adults. So uh, we are going to have lots of child care facilities, which had issues themselves. We'll leave that to one side. Building the child care facilities was an absolute some of the ideas they had. Uh, the second five-year plan was heavy industry uh, top priority. In which case, building a navy actually fits to that. Uh, their plan was the Soviet Union should not be far behind Germany as one of the major steel-producing countries of the world. But again, as a rule, they're aiming not for the higher quality steels. It's One interesting thing is, again, when you're aiming for volume of steel, you're often not aiming for the higher quality steels we would associate with ship armor. There is a reason why historically the Russians produce some cruisers, but they have very thin armor, and they don't produce um, they don't produce sort of the same level of other things. They don't, you know, build battleships at the same rate, and it's because their industry is fo they don't build the industry to build armor steel that thick, or as thick as it's required to be for that in the volume required for cruisers, let alone capital ships historically so this is one thing you've got to add in okay so they've got to add in the facilities to produce their own armor fairly sure they'll be happy to buy turbines and things abroad i'll get into that but armor they're going to want to build domestically in which case they're going to have to buy the equipment import it from somewhere because domestically building that equipment is going to take even longer to develop and build it so if you want to build it, you can build the plant, but the plant machinery to actually create that armor, you're going to have to import from someone. Uh, your choices, realistically, for the Soviet Union are Italy, which will has armor manufacturing capabilities and has the capability to produce the armor systems, America and Britain. Japan, you do not have a good enough relationship and doesn't have in enough infrastructure industry to really to keep up with its own demands and start producing it for other people as well is pushing it. Germany at this point is nowhere near that capability. We're talking 1930. This is long time before anything happens that Germany can really start maximizing it on that scenario. So you have three options realistically as far as the, the Soviet Union is concerned. You also theoretically have the French but as we've been over before in other videos, the French at this time are really just about catching up metallurgically in terms of the development of armour. They have really been working hard and pushing into it and really growing their capabilities, which is all a good thing, but it means they don't have a lot of infrastructure spare and a lot of systems they are doing are experimental. They don't have a refined design for you to buy for a plant off the shelf. Whereas, and I, I, I will be honest about this, realistically... The yard, the people you go to are Vickers or Bethlehem Steel. That's the two big companies, big corporations that actually can produce that sort of material on scale in the required amount of time for a reasonable price. So that's your realistic options. It's basically Vickers and Bethlehem. Uh, they also have the experience. The reason I'm using them is they're not just major corporations which can produce these things. They actually produce armor themselves, so they have the machinery and they have the know-how. They're not just producing the machinery to do it. They have everything. So they're a one-stop shop for you to go to and get the ideas. Second to five-year plan was about making railways faster, more reliable. Yeah. Uh, Military-wise, it was to build the foundation for the next five-year plan, which would include growing the Navy, which would include growing the Army and growing historically. So basically, you're just canting the Navy a bit of it earlier. Second year, five-year plan was um, just successful. 
It was a great propaganda success. They trumpeted it from everywhere. They really did. It just wasn't actually a success. It just wasn't. But the point I want to make is, despite all that, the, the Soviets do produce some very good designs. Please don't get me wrong. The Soviets are very capable of producing some very decent designs. The Gvini class destroyers that were produced 1935 onwards are some really interesting ships. And they are quite a capable little class of little destroyers. And so we have to be respectful to an extent of the Soviet Union because it's very easy to write them off because they're not in the treaties historically. And historically they only have the gang guts and they have plans for capital ships and they never come to fruition and go, he'll go, oh, they couldn't have done it. No. They have the knowledge, they have the understanding, they have the willingness to buy it in when they don't. There is a lot of propaganda around the Soviet military effort machine, but there is a lot of reality around its management. Propaganda, image, and reality do not have to match up when you have a total control of the information sphere. And that is the, that is the reality of the Soviet system. A total control of the information sphere, uh, sphere allows you to basically go, well, we're going to market this as a giant great big victory for our national capabilities. Inside, the engines might be a design which have been bought, has been bought from the Italians who bought it themselves from a fr uh, the, fr uh, the British and the French in a combined development. Or rather bought it from the French who ha were producing it on a licensed variant of a British design. As you find in the Kirov class cruisers. These are what the Soviets do actually build in this period. And these are good ships. Again, they're a decent design, a decent capability of a cruiser. They don't get a lot of discussion about them. But again, I've talked about them on this channel before. And they are a fine basis for the Soviet constructions. They have incredibly thin armor. This has brought up an interesting discussion with people recently, which was a case of, well, you know, when we're doing this live, actually, uh, well, if they're doing, if the armor's going to battleships, they won't have the armor for production of, of tanks. And because of the way you roll armor out, that is actually the case. It's a very, it's a different process for battleship armor for that thing versus tank armor. But actually, when you consider it, the cruisers built actually used armor which wasn't as dissimilar and came from a similar plant as a tank armor. So there's a really interesting scenario here we'll be getting into whereby the Soviets could actually end up with more armor to build more tanks in the 1930s because they actually are part of the treaty system. And that's the joy of industrial economics. That is the joy of working through this process. But you also have to remember that if the Soviets are putting out money into ships, they're not putting the money into something else. So there is going to be a swings and a roundabout scenario. There has to be. I can't tell you what that's going to be. Because that honestly depends on Comrade Stalin. It depends on him far more than me. And there are many who have tried to predict what Stalin was going to do in any situation. There are many who at the time who claimed they could predict what he was saying or was thinking. I honestly don't think you can. I don't think it's really viable. Because Stalin was mercurial at best. Was... Close-minded at worst. And he was always, always in his own head. And that's a problem. That's a problem when it comes to predicting people. Now, historically, when his battleships began, he goes for the Sovetsi Soyuz, and they're sort of a mashup between the Scharnhorst, the Littorios, and the Ganguts, and the battle cruisers look something like the Deutschlands. And that's because he's actually getting information from the Italians and from the Germans. And basically, what you're often looking at these ships is Italian insides and German outsides. So, to extent that the, the outside are modelled on the Northern European that has the closest to the weather they deal with in the Baltic, where his primary fleet building areas are, and the North, uh, North Atlantic, where it's 
he's planning a northern fleet to be based. And of course, he's planning a fleet for the Pacific. He wants to build up a fleet in the Pacific, and he wants a fleet in the Black Sea. And if you're going to build ships, well, the Black uh, build ships for those ones. If you design a ship that can take operating in the North Atlantic, it will most likely be able to operate in the Baltic. It will most likely be able to operate in the Pacific, and definitely be able to operate in the Black Sea. If you design a ship for North Atlantic with a Bal with a Baltic twist. Well, then it will definitely be able to operate in the Pacific, and the Black Sea will be like a mill pond for it. That's what you've got with some of the designs going on, and some of the thought process going on behind their designing. But again, there's very much a lot of Soviet design work going into this. So this means we have to now think about 1930, because historically, Stalin didn't send anyone to the Net Treaties. He did almost to the London Naval Treaty, but he didn't. And that's where I'm going to get into probably the thing which is going to be the first big contentious issue. Why would he actually have sent someone to the London Naval Treaty? Well, the options are ego, interest and need. We can cross out need. Because need, I have to change so much history, it changes the entirety of the scenario we're talking about. And I have a very strict rule when I'm doing alternate histories. They're a good way to learn about history. But the moment you've made too many changes, you're no longer doing alternate history, you are doing fiction. You're not evaluating the history or giving a counterpoint or a, an idea of what might have happened and why, therefore, X and Y and Z did happen. You are now writing a fiction work. And as I always say on my channel, if you want great fiction, go see Glenn Stewart. Go read his books. They are excellent, exceptional science fiction. I'm a historian. I will try to keep it as close to the history as possible. There are some points where I'm having to make a judgment call, but I'll tell you when I'm making a judgment call, and I'll tell you why I'm making the judgment call, as I always do with alternate history. So, ego, interest, and need. Need we can cross out. Ego and interest. That's something different. You see... The Soviet Union, as said, almost did come. And it almost came because it heard Germany might be invited. Now, that was quickly quashed by the French. But, if it hadn't been quashed by the French, if it hadn't been put down quite so hard, and the British and Americans hadn't supported them so quickly by agreeing with it. There is a good, good, well, in most ways, there's a strong likelihood that Stalin announces, even if maybe Stalin acted more quickly, announces he is sending a delegation and wishes to join the London and the Naval Treaty discussions. And it would be hard to turn them out. Uh, there are various problems with some other people being sent. I'm fairly sure, as I said, Romald Mikhailovich, who is the chief of the Soviet Navy in 1927 to 1931, is probably going to be sent. But, as I said, I think Maxim, Maxim Litv Litvinov is the one who is sent with him as the diplomat, rather than Gregory Chisholm. Partially because Chisholm had actually been imprisoned by the British in 1917 because of his anti-war writings during World War I. Partly because um, he really, really didn't like and had made a big fuss about um, the British blocking the Soviet expansion into Asia. Uh, he felt that the Soviet Union or Russia, or Soviet Union, the matter, should naturally take over all of Asia. And for some reason, the British didn't like this idea. Um, he could never understand why the British would get in the way of the natural order of things. I'm sure there were British personnel who couldn't understand why he was getting the natural order of things of them taking over the whole world. So, you know, it's even up on one side. But the, usually those personalities do not make the best ambassadors or people to send to conferences like this. And Stalin is going to want to come into this conference with a game plan. He's going to want to be a strong position the whole way through. So he doesn't want a loose cannon. 
Litvinov is someone he's already got in his mind, I would say at this point, to succeed Shishrin. So I would say it would be the perfect outing to send him to the naval tra negotiations. Because that then gives him the chance to provide a reason for promoting him. He's done so well at the promotion, at the treaty, at the negotiations. Okay, now he is the new uh, People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union. And um, Chishrin can now retire. Or be uh, promoted to another duty. It makes sense. There probably would be a third delegate as well, but I'm really not sure who that would have been. There's, pardon me, which wonders if it might be Stalin himself. He did like his ships, after all. It seems to be another thing dictators tend to share. Uh, they really love big ships. They really, really do love big ships. But... No, probably not him. Probably... If he really wanted to cause a fuss, he might try and find a female diplomat to send to really cause them problems and make a leader delegation. But again, I doubt he would do that. He didn't do that in every other meetings, and he'd be serious about this one. So he probably would pick someone who came from another section of the Soviet government machine. Uh, he'd have a naval officer, he'd have a diplomat, someone probably from the Secretariat. Uh, probably from his own his own internal party machine would be a likely inclusion. And what will he want? Well, for that we have to look at his plans. The second slash third five year plan had an idea of four later eight Type A Project 23 units of 41,500 tons with nine 16 inch guns. Four later 16 Type B Project 25 units with of 26,300 tons with nine 12 inch guns and 20 plus uh, 20 cruisers, 17 destroyer leaders, 182 warships, and 244 submarines. Now I can tell you now that that whole uh, lovely organization is not going to be accepted because let's be honest, that is putting the Soviet Union straight up there with Britain and America, and there's no way in any of this treaty system they're going to accept that. But in 1930, what would he really be looking at? Well, if you consider the earliest designs of their battleships, quite a lot of them follow this outline as pictured in Project 21, uh, which was 35,000 standard tons, maximum speed, 30 knots, uh, 9 16-inch guns, 12 6-inch guns, 12 4-inch guns, 36 Three point thirty-seven millimeter guns, so that's uh, let's be honest, roughly inch and a half guns. And honestly, there is a good discussion as to whether or not you're going to have paper thin armor. <laughs> there is a really decent discussion, considering thirty ton, uh, thirty knots, and that shaping of speed. And it it is now Rodsky. Now, the Project Twenty One units are fairly decent. I think Stalin would not want to be modernizing the Gangots. If he's building new, he wants to get rid of the Gangots, but he's not going to get rid of the Gangots till all of the Project 21 units or whatever like them comes in. And he's probably going to sign up to that agreement. He's going to want 35,000 ton zone 16 inch guns. There is no scenario where Stalin comes into this treaty and goes, you know what, Britain, you know you've been asking for smaller ships and smaller guns. I support this. There is no scenario Stalin does that. He wants big. He wants powerful. And he's probably going to lie about it. And the cruisers, destroyer leaders, destroyers, and submarines are all things he's going to want. Why? Because he views them as necessary to secure Soviet security. I'm using that phrase to emphasize it. It's all about security. It's all about strength. Now, of course, at this point, Germany's not been invited. I'm not even going to have Germany turning up the treaty. But once Stalin committed publicly, he's not going to fall out, or drop out. 
So even if he finds out afterwards that, that Germany's not coming, that's not going to bother him. He's going to want to turn up. Now, the treaty as it historically was, there's an interesting point to get into. There is an interesting point to discuss. The treaty as historically is, well, it keeps up the limits from the Washington Naval Treaty. It expands them into cruisers. It has other clarifications when it comes to cruisers, and you see the different powers have different metrics of what cruisers they want. The British want to maximize their number of cruisers, so they want the tonnage available in 6-inch cruisers, which are smaller than the 8-inch gun cruisers, and the Britain wants to basically maximize their cruiser numbers to cover their presence around the world. It's the whole classic problem. You, could, you don't cover the world with your battle fleet. You do not. I know there are some people who talk about the risk fleet strategy and how it drew Britain's battle fleet back to Britain and uh, and caused Britain to abandon the rest of the world and contract and all these things. That was never the case. If you look through historically, the battle fleet, the first, second, and bulk of the third rates, are always in Britain. Uh, the battleships then are always in Britain, Mediterranean those sort of areas, close to Britain's infra largest infrastructure, where it's cheapest to maintain and operate them in peacetime. They're expensive, they are maintenance intensive, they require a lot of training, and if you have them out wandering around the world, they have to spend all their time doing presence mission rather than the training. You can't train as a battle fleet, you want to keep your battle fleet concentrated. Presence mission is done by cruisers. Now, quite right. In the run-up to World War One, as part of the offset of building the Dreadnoughts and all the other modernization programs, fishing, fishing implements, Britain has been getting rid of some of its older ships. But it's also been building newer, some newer cruisers, constantly building them. The town class prior to run-up to World War One, where they had a huge number of those, so many that the Germans were never quite sure how many the British had. Uh, the British just seemed to just produce endless town class, as far as the Germans were concerned. They weren't, they weren't sure where they were all coming from. And in the run-up to World War II, it's again, this is the Royal Navy producing the town class. The Royal Navy are producing all these light cruisers. And they are present, their presence around the world. They're what are the face of it. The, the battle fleet you keep in home waters or Mediterranean where you can easily support and sustain it and operate it and train it until you need to deploy it elsewhere. That's when you deploy it elsewhere. And you have the infrastructure elsewhere to support it. You build the infrastructure in peacetime, but in peacetime the presence is done by the cruisers. And that's what Britain's looking at. Britain's looking at this thing and going, well, we need cruisers. We need presence around the world. If you're going to put this tonnage limitation, because remember, the Washington Treaty doesn't have a cumulative limit on cruisers. It says they can only be more, they can't displace more than 10,000 tons, but you can build as many of them as you like. And that's what Britain's been merrily poplaring along with, quite happily building cruisers, building cruisers, building cruisers. Happily to uh, toodling along doing that. And suddenly the London Treaty comes in and the politicians go, we have a great idea about how to limit, uh, to make conflict impossible in the future. How? We're going to limit cruiser numbers. And basically the Royal Navy is looking at the British politicians going, are you nuts? Are you absolutely insane? It'll save money. It'll lead to war. Because the traditional me British method of deterring conflict wasn't to build up a massive battle fleet. They did that when they had to. That's the Anglo-German naval race, which, as said, is part of a wider naval race in terms of the qualitative race between Britain, America, Italy, and Japan. And Germany then gets into that with a quantitative race versus Britain as well to add extra funds. All sorts of funds. The Austro-Hungarians turn up in the qualitative race as well. And this is prior to World War I. But the whole way through, Britain keeps churning out a large number of cruisers. That's what's... I discussed in a video last year on the building the fleets of the Jut of Jutland. The fact that the British are able to build their cruiser fleet and still have a large cruiser fleet, whilst the Germans have to sacrifice constructing their cruiser fleet to try and build their dreadnoughts and to build them. The British always rely on building a large cruiser fleet for their global presence, for their global security. This is the uh, these sort of criteria here are the ones which really really caused the Admiralty to have a panic attack, and it's from this point onwards you start hearing constant verbiage in British papers, in the British public press, in British defence discussions about the cruiser gap, about the quantity of cruisers needed by the Royal Navy to do the missions it's being assigned, versus the quantity it has and is able to get under the treaty limits. 
the moment it starts to appear is the moment the 1930 London Naval Treaty. For Japan, their big issue is they are feeling restricted. At this point is the, when they decide to start investing in infrastructure and they are going to leave at the next treaty. They are basically agreeing to this treaty with the full knowledge they are not going to stay in past 1936. They are... Everything is planned on that. They are accepting all this stuff on the basis that this is the starting point. They are going to be able to build more from 1936 onwards. And again, they're planning for war in the middle of the 1940s. Everyone's starting already in this perspective. Remember, it's two years away from Britain going, yeah, the 10-year rule's gone. 10-year rule, no more. There's going to be war within 10 years. We can no longer count on the 10-year rule. We have to actually spend more on defence. That's when this treaty's done. Italy and France, well, they're having issues, but not as... Uh, France is having the most issues, because France is sitting there going, we've tied ourselves to Italy. And the trouble is, Italy can afford to concentrate in the Mediterranean. We have to cover the world. So we can either defend ourselves in the Mediterranean from Italy, who are our chief antagonist, or we can defend our global presence. And that's one of the reasons why Italy and France aren't included in the cruiser and destroyer limitations in terms of the cumulative limitations, or the submarine ones, to allow them, to allow them, allow the French, to be able to secure that position. The French basically almost say they're going to withdraw from the treaty. They won't be part of the treaty, which would mean Italy wouldn't be part of the treaty. Which would mean Britain couldn't mean part of the treaty because Britain can't afford to have Italy building unrestricted in Mediterranean, which is a principal trade route for Britain with its global empire, and not be able to match it. So, in order to get the treaty through and get the politicians all signed, France and Italy, because Italy matches France and won't accept less than France gets, cannot be cumulatively restricted. But it's all based, and this is where escalator clauses start to come in, on the idea that if they, if they build too much... These figures can also change. So, if France had really wanted to be really helpful to Britain, they could have gone on a cruiser building spree. And then Italy would have responded with a cruiser building spree. And Britain could have justified going on a really big cruiser building spree, a spree and just gone, we have to because of the escalator clause. And that would have been... Wonderful for everyone in terms of having enough cruisers for World War II. <laughs> Sadly, it didn't happen. Sadly, it didn't happen. There are also all sorts of other cutouts. There's cutouts for submarines in terms of the Surkov, etc. France gets uh, France gets specifically allowed the Surkov, and all these things come into this. But yeah. and of course. Going back to my earlier book, it's where you start to get the uh, treaty, the destroyer leader concept of the 1850-ton destroyer, which for most navies becomes a super destroyer, fast with lots of torpedoes. For the Royal Navy, goes. What happens if we replace some of the torpedoes with guns? We can still make it fast, but uh, we then have something we can use as a mini cruiser. Yes, it's the cruiser gap. Now, with all this complexity already going on in this treaty, in this treaty as is, to reach it as is, and honestly, Britain coming in going, oh, do you want to make cruise, uh, ships smaller? And Japan going, do you want to make ships smaller? And America going, no, we really want them 16-inch guns and 35,000 tons. Add Stalin. Add Stalin. Well, I said, the minimum he really is going to accept is three battleships per fleet. That's the minimum he's going to accept. And I don't think he's going to accept less than parity with Japan. But Japan with only nine ships is not going to accept parity and going to accept Stalin. You see, Stalin's going to come in and he's want, going to want to, first of all, he's probably going to come in and try and demand parity with Britain and America. That's not going to go. That would never get agreed to by Britain and America. For starters, there is no way they'd agree to it with the tonnage limitations they have existingly. Secondly, any tonnage that's agreed to with with Stalin is going to alter the metrics for Britain and for America. Okay? If Stalin's going to be building up ships, then as far as Britain's concerned, and this is what that would be part of the treaty, he'd be going to build ships, 
Britain would need to build up ships as well. Because the biggest threat to India is Stalin. And so any war which might involve the Russians trying to attack India, or the Soviet Union attacking India, it probably go, would probably have a naval component, especially if Stalin has battleships, and Britain would probably want to try and implement those to try and do something about it. Uh, to, try and st uh, tr uh, to try and blockade off, cut off Soviet trade from the rest of the world. And, again, if Stalin has battleships for that, to try and protect that trade, or to try and protect those areas, or maybe Britain wants to do a diversionary attack elsewhere, there's all sorts of scenarios where it can happen. Britain's going to want a fleet. There's also America going to want a fleet, because, again, that's going to be another presence in the Pacific. And who knows where the Soviet Union might fall. We like to think of us, uh, think today of the French as running an independent foreign policy. Well, to an extent they do, but they're also kind of predictable. They act always in French interests. And you can work out to an extent, uh, to an extent what French interests are. It makes sense. There is a logic to it. The Soviet Union is an enigma true enigma. They haven't done much on the international stage at this point. They have fought a few wars, they've done a few nasty things, but honestly they kept mostly to themselves. If they are building a fleet, they are planning on, Soviet Union has always talked about this, on acting on the global stage far more. That's going to change things. That's going to have an impact and you don't know where it's going to go. So I think when Stalin comes in, he's going to start, uh, settle for demanding the same as Japan. But Japan won't accept the set him having the same, and he doesn't. He needs more battleships than Japan has. Japan's allocated nine ships. If we go back to this treaty limitation, and we look at it, it's thirty-five thousand ton limit. Japan is allocated three hundred fifteen thousand tons, so nine battleships. Stalin will want more than nine. He wants a minimum of twelve. Why am I saying a minimum of twelve? It's a very simple reason for that. To guarantee availability and operationability of one, you need at least three, and when you're talking naval terms. And he'll want each of his fleets to have battleships. So, Northern Fleet, Baltic, Black Sea, Pacific. And I think, again, for Stalin coming into this, he'd be treating this as cover for him doing a build-up and being able to get all the support in infrastructure industry... And then he would be going to leave the 1936 Naval Treaty. He wouldn't be going to sign the next treaty. So it's kind of like Japan is at this point and Italy. Remember, again, Italy doesn't sign the 1936 Naval Treaty. So I think you get another... The, the autocratic power, again, is going in going, right, then I'm using this treaty as coverage for my growth. That's what I'm approaching this. And that's what he's requesting. He's not so much requesting as demanding as his minimums. And let's put it from the power of the other powers. If Stalin g doesn't get what he wants, doesn't get included in the treaty, you then have someone building outside the treaty, might be building ships bigger than the treaty, might be doing all sorts of things, which are going to destabilize the treaty anyway, and that's going to cause you even more trouble. So if you're a politician wanting to save money, do you want Stalin on the outside or the inside? You want him on the inside. Because at least then you can predict what he's going to do to an extent. Or rather, he's theoretically limited to an extent with what he can do. So what does happen? Well, again, I'm going to emphasize, if it doesn't collapse. And from all I've discussed, you can see there is a myriad minefield here of things that could collapse. And could collapse it. But broadly speaking, I thought, well, if it survived, the treaty's not going to be too dissimilar to what it was historically. I don't think the, the individual ship unit sizes are going to change. However, cumulative totals are. Cumulative totals are. And if we keep the ratios the same, as we historically did, that is going to change things again. And that is where we get to. Now, what I'm going to do here is, because you really need to read this, I'm going to expand it to full screen so I can explain it to you. So I'm going to disappear for a second. I'm explaining it. I'm trying a new thing with videos recently. I'm explaining things before I do them rather than just doing them. I hope it's helping. I hope it's making things better. It's also making it more obvious when I make a mistake like that. <laughs> Lose control of it. So, the categories, as you can see, 
Britain and America now have 20 capital ships. Now, there is a reason for this. If Japan and the Soviet Union are allowed 12, the 5 free ratio, that takes Britain and America up to 20. That doesn't mean they have to get to 20 immediately. They don't have to go out the door and go, we have to build up to this tonnage right now. You know, they have just gone from having a tonnage of some reduction of 525,000 tons. So they're t you're talking about they can build five more battleships. And they ha can have to again build that period between now and 1936. That is not going to be an excessive construction for them. Historically, the Americans do start constructing theirs earlier. In the run-up to World War II, they do start slightly earlier. That's because the British, of course, had Nelson and Rodney, so they had... They, they, uh, there's a little, little more time before the British can really get started on the treaty system. But the scenario, they're allowed to build some, so they would. They're 35,000 tons, standard 4 and 6 millimeter, 16 inch guns. I wouldn't be surprised if the you saw something come out which was pretty much a variant on the... Uh, the British either go for a 4 twin scenario... Or a free triple scenario. They're probably going to wait. And probably it'll be ordered in pairs. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Americans do this as well. If they both order a pair. See what everyone else is doing. And then order another pair. And maybe a third one on top, uh, a third one of the final pair. Or a fifth vessel. I can see both nations following that policy. Japan gets to go up to 420,000 tons. So they get to build free battleships. This is going to be a big win for Japan. This actually might strengthen the pro-treaty alliance in Japan. The pro-treaty factions. Because if they're able to build free battleships, that's strengthening Japan. That's making Japan stronger. Soviet Union, of course, is allowed to build 12 ships. Uh, for Italy and France, they're both allowed 280,000 tons. And I know there's a common missing from Italy. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't notice this in live and didn't notice till I did this now. I do apologize. But that 280,000 tons, well, what's that going to equate to a difference on? If we go back to their original tonnage, they're allowed 175,000 tons. So that's 105,000 tons limit difference. They can build probably three more ships. So I don't think you get the Dunkirks because they can build full-size battleships now. The, the French might go straight for the, la the larger designs. I'll get into that discussion later. Carriers. Well, carrier tonnage is, of course, growing. Because, again, if Stalin's getting allocated carriers, he's going to want a carrier for every single fleet. You can't do that on the 81,000 tons the, uh, the, uh, the Japanese originally had. They originally had an allocation of free carriers. You can do that on six carriers. So, simply put, double the carrier tonnage going through. Now, what changes is this going to have? Well, for starters, I think both the American and British carriers are going to grow. I'll get into this and explain this why. But I think it's the simplest solution the whole way through. And I think, honestly, you will find it will be the simple solutions that they will have to go for. But also, it makes sense for Britain and America as well, because they're not just building carriers to deal with potentially what Japan's doing, and what Italy or France or other people are doing, or each other's doing. They have to now include the Soviet Union. So this has got to be a factor. When people go... there are I, I saw someone who did a whole paper about this, and basically they left everyone's tonnages exactly the same. And they said, you know, it would just be the same, and the Soviet Union would just slot in as Japan. Hey, so you know, they're not, not having equipment, but also that's not taking account the fact that the British and the United States will want equipment to be able to counter what the Soviets might do as well, whilst also being able to deter conflict. You're adding in another major power, you're adding in another Japan, and you, in terms of naval strength, and you think Britain and America are going to want to stay uh, stay equal on that level? If we go back to the original tonnage, if we go back to the original ratios. And we consider that if Japan has 315,000 tons and so does the Soviet Union, then theoretically, if Britain or America has 525,000 tons, Japan and the Soviet Union combined could outmatch one of them. If you consider under the original designations, Japan could combine with either Italy or France, and they still have less tonnage than Britain and America. 
There is a reason for that. That is the security Britain and America have for being number ones in the world. So, whilst you can say, well, they can still do that, they can still they combine their 420,000 tons, you have given the British a lot more room. And again, the British are going to be able to build, and Americans are going to be able to build five new ships. They're going to be five good ships. The Italians and the French. You're going to give them more options for deterring the greater the, the greater Soviet Union strength. Whatever happened, you were going to have that. But if you left it as it was and you didn't grow yourselves, you wouldn't be able to match in that threat. For Britain, that means you'd have five, with a 20 ship formation, and let's say they do get now 20 ships, but let's be honest, the reality is if they build five ships, they they have for Nelson and Rodney, so that's seven. You'd have the three battle cruisers, Hood, Renown, Repulse. That takes it up to ten. You then have the five R's and the fine five Queen Elizabeths. That takes it up to twenty. You also, at this point, still in tonnage terms, have HMS Tiger wandering around. So, there are options. And again, Tiger might survive in this scenario a bit longer, because let's be honest, if they're building up, you need this. Now, I will get onto the various nations' reactions to this policy as this video is gone, and I will even do the German reaction to it. So don't worry, I will get there. What I've done with cruisers is basically I've given the Soviet Union to an extent what they want. They wanted 20 cruisers. And the thing is, they've got 20 heavy cruisers. Uh, they have, in this scenario, now got 12 10,000 ton heavy cruisers and 12 10,000 ton light cruisers. Again, you could have given them 10, but it's a 5 3 3 ratio. And working out. 10 and then I'll multiplying them up to the American and British numbers and it's always done all the numbers are always worked out from the American and British numbers down that is the way the treaties go for Britain and America for Britain and, and America that that is just heaven they get 200,000 tons of each so they bo both of them if we go back again to their earlier figures the Americans wanted 180,000 tons of heavy cruiser and the British wanted 190,000 tons of light cruiser in this scenario, they both get 200,000 tons of heavy cruiser and light cruiser each. They're happy. They're in clover as far as the Royal Navy and US Navy are concerned when it comes to cruisers. They can have 20 heavy cruisers and they can try and figure out how many, li uh, how many light cruisers they get. Probably it's not going to be as many as they want. But, because you can start off with our refusers, but even if you go for 8,000 ton Leanders or something like that, you're not getting enough. You're not getting as many as the Royal Navy wants. The Royal Navy wants 70 cruisers. You're not getting 70 new cruisers with 400,000 tons. Not having ships that are going to match in. Again, I've included the extra tonnage for the destroyer leaders because the French and a lot of other navies are already building that and building towards that, so that's one of the reasons why it was included. So, 200,000 tons though for destroyers means that if you're allowing 16% for destroyers up to 18 or 50,000 tons, that's 32,000 tons. Well, again, that's going to allow the Royal Navy and the US Navy to build 17 of those destroyers, maybe even 18 if they fudge it through. And knowing the Royal Navy and the US Navy, they will fudge it through, which would mean instead of, for example, the Royal Navy tribal class those were made of eight ships rather than nine because of working out the tonnage directions, they could be nine ship destroyer flotillas. Could have an interesting impact. And the big loss for the Soviet Union is going to be submarines because 60,000 tons is not going to allow him to build... 240 submarines. He's got all the rest. He's got allocated all the other things to dreams. But the thing is, he couldn't build that many submarines that quickly anyway. So, this is where, this is the Soviet Union's concession. 
Everything else is driven by the Soviet Union's involvement, Soviet Union's concession, and the thing where they're going to go away going, hmm, is going to be submarine numbers. But the fact that they're allowed the same number of submarines, uh, signage of submarines as Japan, Britain, and America is going to be a massive win. That's going to be treated as a big win. Yes, we can't have as many as we like, but we can have this. We are the only ones allowed the same as them. And if these people build too many, we get to grow our fleet. And the interesting case is, of course, they get, again, their own three vessels of no more than 2,800 tons armed with 6.1 inch guns. So we might see Soviet style X, uh, you know, the, 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 the M some, large submarines. Who knows what they'd look like? My brain's short circuiting out the force of what they'd look like, honestly. It's, that's, that's half the trouble. So. Here's the first question I always I get when I'm starting discussing this. What does the Soviet Union build by 1939? Well, if they start laying down in 1931, they don't have the industry they build in 32 to 6, but if Stalin declares this a great hero project and building a fleet a great hero project and maybe builds Fleetograd in uh, the northern, uh, northern fleet area or maybe something similar in the Pacific fleet area, there is a real option, a real scenario that they get some ships in service. I would say the odds of getting a lot in service are low. There are about two yards, one in the Baltic, one in the Black Sea, which are actually viable in 1931 for building ships of this scale and size. And when I say viable, they have the infrastructure, not the personnel or the industry, but they have the actual physical space. There are two more, both in the same in the same places, which could potentially be quickly expanded. So the quickest they can get is four into the production. Given another year, they might be able to start another four or two in the Northern Fleet area and two in the Pacific Fleet area. Um, I would say you're looking at five to six years at least for completion. At least five to six years. And... I would honestly say you are likely to get, by the time of 1939, a maximum of six of those initial eight actually anywhere near service. An insert or in service. I would say your most likely bets for getting them in service are going to be the Baltic. Followed by the Black Sea. And this is going to be completely confusing to people, but I've got a reason for this. Followed by the Pacific. And the reason I say the Pacific is because they're going to have to build everything out there from scratch. Which means, unlike the northern ships, which are going to be close enough to the Baltic and the Black Sea and close enough industry and infrastructure wise that they might well not give them their own specific infrastructure so they're competing or trying to leech off the infrastructure especially from the Baltic the Pacific will have to have it built from scratch and have it all built up I also fundamentally believe that like with the Svetsi Soyuz and various other designs you are going to have a lot of foreign equipment in there. You're going to have very much a Soviet skin, hull, st st structure, and armor, and Soviet constructed guns, probably, in fact, with some assistance procured in from where necessary, over what will be probably license built engines, and more than likely license built gearboxing and perhaps even license built fire control systems. I could see them going to the Italians for their fire control systems. They went for the Italians for pretty much everything else towards their cruiser project in the 1930s. The Italians are major, major naval suppliers. You have to. One of the things that I, I have to find myself explaining quite a lot is the Italians are a major naval innovator in this period. They are. There is a reason they're included in the naval race in the technical and technological naval race and the qualitative naval race that was going on in the dreadnought era and the pre-dreadnought era and there is a, they are still a major power there is a reason they drive naval construction in terms of 
the design and capabilities of ships more than the Germans do for the Royal Navy because Italian ships are geographically in a far more dangerous place. They're usually more numerous, especially post-World War I. They are more numerous. And they are also often far more likely to take leaps in qualitative capability. Um, again, the Francisco Caracolas are what I point to, what they're building in the inner world or one they don't complete. But those ships would have been the world's first true fast, fast battleships. 28 knots, 15 inch guns, very capable armor schemes. Those would have sent a shockwave through the world. Especially if they'd been completed before anyone else could match them. How do Britain and the USA respond? Oh, that's complicated. That is really complicated. I've, d I've designed something which is a bit of a response up there as well. Um, there are honestly a few options for how they respond. For the USA, I'm reckoning the North Carolinas come early. That's it. The North Carolinas come early. They pretty much settle into that design pattern very quickly when they are designing ships, and they are always flirting with that design pattern. They like that idea, they like that shaping, it fits their needs, it fits their strategic needs, it fits their operational needs. It's a good, solid design. They might not be quite as fast, they might not have, because they don't, won't have the high-powered engines, but also there's something to look at here when we consider this picture of the North Carolina, and we look at its structure. If we go back to, especially of its its mast, and we go back to the mast of the Soviet designs, you will see there are some similarities with the Svetsi Soyuz. There is some similarities going on there, and there's a reason for that. It's a good quality structure built to give you a solid platform for fire control from. And I'd argue that that's likely where the Americans end up in terms of capital ships. I'd say, well, carriers are going to be more complicated. I think both Britain and America end up with carriers which are far closer to the Malta and Midway classes than they were historically building this point. Because with a 10 carrier limit, to provide enough shit, enough carriers, you no longer have to keep quite as low in your tonnage. One of the really interesting things about the carrier displacement except that happens, is whilst they're theoretically allowed up to 27,000 tonnes, they can't, no one can build that many because you can't get enough vessels to cover your commitments when you build to that tonnage. That's why the British are down at 22,000, 23,000 tons. I would say if you've got 270,000 tons, 27,000 tons of carrier gives you 10 carriers. Now, Britain might not go, Britain and America might not go to that, but I could see Britain ending up with an Ark Royal style vessel which has an illustrious class armoured deck. Because they don't have to make the choice between the strike carrier air group or the survivability of the fleet carrier. They can go with a common hull for both. Uh, that A common hull that does one roll, one large fleet carrier. And you might end up, I think the Americans end up the same. Because the Americans, they don't want to go for the flight decks they go to because they want to. They want to maximise air group. But they're making that choice knowingly against maximizing survivability and not having the flight deck as a strength deck because of you cannot balance it all under the treaty limitations. You cannot get it all that under the treaty limitations. And that's the problem. That's the issue, the treaty limitations. So I would reckon, if you consider Ark Royal was 22,000 tons. 25,000 tons probably gives you the armored deck might even give you deck edge lifts, which was another thing the British considered to maximise hangar space, but again, they felt it would add on to the weight. It doesn't in reality, okay? The British designers were wrong in that scenario, but that was one of the things that went through their minds. So, you could end up with that on the British side, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Americans, the Yorktowns, end up having... Uh, armoured flight deck, or well, at least having the, armor, the, the flight deck as a strength deck. And, you know, they're both designs will probably end up at roughly 25 to 26,000 tonnes. 25,000 tonnes means they can buy 10 of them and have a 20,000 tonne carrier. 
each, you know, that this is the thing. With 270,000 tons, they are not going to max it out. If they get it for anything less, gives them slightly more. So if they go for 24,000 tons, they could then get two 15,000 ton carriers. It's it's going to be up to the, how navies work it out and how they spend how they spend it, but they gonna, are going to be capable of a lot more and a lot more construction. So I think they will do that. The reason I think they'll do it is, again, the Soviet Union, I wouldn't be surprised if they start a carrier construction program. I will not be surprised because there are certain fleets which actually carriers work with. with so it's for some, the Baltic really doesn't suit a carrier program. But for the Soviets, that's useful because they're going to want to concentrate their carriers to supplement their fleets where they need them. Baltic, Black Sea, not really good areas for the carriers. Northern Fleet, that'll do. Pacific, definitely. They will be going to be keen on those for that. I think cruiser-wise, you see more of what they built historically. The British will probably build, some, uh, build their next round of, ca of county-class cruisers. You might not see the cut price counties. You probably will still see the cut price counties, aka York and Exeter. But, you know, there is a possibility they'll actually build some decent uh, uh, new county class cru uh, heavy cruisers in the run up to World War II. I'd also argue they'll just build more of that, what they did with the town class, etc., cruisers. And again, going down the destroyers, I don't see either nation really going radically different design wise. For Britain, though, it's different, uh, difficult. For Britain, it is difficult because, again, you will see more of these designs if you go and look at the video I did put up on the 22nd of March 2024, which is about Britain's lost generation of designs. If you look at the design process until 1927, what we can find a design process, and I did get into this, uh, there are 14-inch designs, there's 16-inch designs, there's 14, uh, there's 12-inch, 10-inch, even 11-inch design, which makes the uh, which makes the channels look preppy. That's what I've written in my notes, as you can see. Now, with the Americans and the Soviets focusing on a 16-inch gun, 35,000 tons, um, and J Britain's going to probably go. Well, let me put it this way. Whilst the politicians might want less and might want smaller ships, they're not going to build less unless they've got a smaller ships unless they've got a treaty which agrees it. It's a very core thing about the fourteen-inch gun ships on the uh, fourteen-inch guns on the King George V. The politicians have to have a treaty which they think is going to agree and push that in before they can get it through, before they can get it accepted. Otherwise, they will die in Parliament because whilst the British government might not want to spend the money. The British public expect them to not have to have a navy second to none. Similar to the American requirements. Remember, this is not many years after the We Want Eight campaign, where the Treasury wanted to buy uh, pay for four, the Admiralty wanted six, and they ended up settling on eight because of a political campaign. This is the reality, the scenario you're dealing with in Britain. Okay, it, it, it's complicated. So it's going to be sixteen-inch, thirty-five thousand-ton ships. And I reckon they're going to end up being 28 knot, 35,000 ton standard weight, 16 inch gun vessels. Pretty much uh, similar to what I put up here. I, 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 put, I, I looked at the 1928 16A design, which, again, if you go look in the video uh, I talked about, and actually I'll put a link to the video up here. They'll, they'll flash up as a card up here. You will find. They were talking about four twin turrets, eight guns. That's, again, only viable as long as other people are really making the choice. Because once it's politics which are deciding what size battleship you're getting, it's politics which are going to define it. So I see them going with a sort of F3 style all forward gun arrangement. And aviation back, probably 4.7 inch twin uh, 4.7 inch guns maybe 5.2 inch or 5.25 inch guns but it's a 4.7 inch they're really working in this point and the 5.5 inch has got a bit of work going on on it at this point so i reckon it's probably 4.7 inch as a secondary they might go 15 inch rather than 16 inch guns they might as a political statement 
and that can save roughly a thousand tons. The Royal Navy actually had worked that out, and they'd done the development work and the study work to do this. So they could put in armor uh, that could allow armor, more speed, and better protection for all, all around the ship. So it could be the British go with fifteen inch uh, go with a fifteen inch fifty design or a fifteen inch forty five design instead of a 16-inch gunship. But if they do, that's a political statement by the British government going, we don't believe 16-inch guns, you know, this is necessary. We're making a statement for world peace. It's a nice thing to do. Um, it's also, in a scenario where everyone else is building 16-inch and knowingly building 16-inch, the smallest the British can jump down to is 15-inch whilst preserving national identity and the politicians can think they're saving money because they can just use the really good shells which have been developed for the 15 inch guns already um that's the thing they don't have to develop new shells and they know the 16 inch guns for nelson and rodney are really not as good as they were um, they were planned to be uh you have to remember again this is one of the scenarios which can happen with nations the british tested the german guns and they got a load of false positives from their testing on the German guns, and that guided development of the 16-inch gun, which was used in Nelson Romney. Rather, and it's this is where things come from, because people go, well, didn't they use the gun from the G3s? No, the gun from the G3s was the 16.5-inch gun, developed from the same line as the 15-inch gun. And it's only after they cancel the G3s, they go, we've got to develop a 16-inch gun, that's when all the testing of the German guns is put into the program, and they develop this new 16-inch gun based on those ideas. So basically the 16 and a half inch gun of the G3s was a 16 and a half inch version of the 15 inch gun. It was a 16 and a half inch 45. It's it's all a load of interesting history, but ultimately I think the British go with a 16 or 15 inch all forward a uh, 15 inch gun all forward design and probably free triple turrets. Because that's what everyone else is doing, and they will want to look like, as good as everyone else. They might go for a, a and I think this is what they looked like in the first version. I think probably in the second batch and the third batch, they looked like this. I think they basically go, hang on, if they can do it, we can do it as well. We don't need to go necessarily with an all forward design. We can make it work. Again, it's a decision made based on infrastructure, but the American ships and the British ships and the infrastructure available is not too dissimilar. It is possible. And the British do, of course, eventually go to that decision when they're making the King George V, the planning the li building alliance, and the Vanguard as well. So it's it's not impossible. They could have done that. And especially with the 15-inch guns, they could have gone for that form. And then, of course, they can modernize their other 15-inch gun ships if they gone with a 15-inch gun, which allows them to strengthen the fleet overall. So, there is some go there are some good arguments for going with a 15-inch gun. Has it affect France and Italy? Well, that's that's actually less complicated in some ways than the major powers. For France, we know what they would like to build. It's a Dunkirk, but it's not a Dunkirk. It's the uh, enlarged suffering class battleship, uh, suffering class cruiser. And this was the suffering basically shaped battleship where the French used their excellent cruising developments to go, this is how we can scale this up to a battleship. It's a really cool design and I think that's what they go with. I think there would be three of those rolling out of the yards. Not quickly because these are French yards and they'll take their own sweet time. But yeah, I, I think this is what's getting built. I don't think it's Dunkirk's. Now for the Italians... Well, they used their infrastructure to rebuild the Conte de Cavours and Andrea Doria as a way to build up their infrastructure. If they're getting a lot more money from the Soviet Union because they're building ships and using them as their backdoor pipeline to get their tech upgrades, well, that gives them in an earlier run to start on the Littorios, building at least three of them. Which means that by the time you get to 1939... They are probably working on the successors to the Latorios. Their next batch of new battleships. The ones that are going to replace the Conte de Cavours, etc. Which is a whole interesting can of worms to open. Because theoretically this means perhaps the Italians don't 
don't create, uh, don't build as many of their cruisers as they did historically, but they're going to have a lot stronger battle fleet. And that's again going to drive some of the British decision making in the war in Mediterranean, and the war or the wider war in World War Two, if that happens as it did historically. I think overall, France does quite well out of this. The Italians could be more complicated, but both are, uh, France could do better out of this because they're starting earlier. And they're going to get a more balanced ship. It'd be really interesting to see what happens with them and how they use them. But I think they would be considered very good ships. Looking at the bare plans they have for them, like things like this, I think they could have been a very interesting, very capable design. Yes, they're going to have four, three quad 12-inch turrets. And everyone else is going to be having 16-inch guns, so they're going to be laughed at. Bit, but they're also going to be 33 knot ships, which means they're going to be very firmly in the fast battleship category. At which point, though, the world is made even more complicated because we have Japan. What does Japan do? Well, this is a Tusa. Uh, and historically, that was coming after Nagato. Well, the question comes, what do they do? I think they start up their fast battleship program again. And actually, for the Japanese, this is a golden opportunity. They also have a track record from history of Yamato Mushashi of being able to, quite happy to hamstring the rest of the procurement and the rest of their naval construction by focusing in on building some battleships. This scenario, they're able to get three 16-inch battleships. And even if they're planning and working, which they were at this point, towards those 18-inch gunships, the infrastructure development needed to put the, to implement and build these ships is going to provide an excellent basis for building those ships. So rather than having to rebuild all their infrastructure and rebuild a lot of the support behind it to build the Yamato Mashashi, they can now start this a lot earlier. They can build these ships. It's a warm-up. And they get three of them. They can get three new fast battleships. They will be built. Um, they will be 16-inch gun ships. The question is, will they be eight, Will they be 10 gun ships in five twin turrets? Will they be nine gun ships in three triple turrets? Will they try and go for 12 gun ships and lie completely? I would... Honestly, not be surprised. They turn out to have four triple turrets or something like that. Or they might be designed with four triple turrets in 16-inch, able to be converted to four twin turrets for 18-inch later on. This is not out of the realms of possibility for the Japanese. With the cruiser and carrier tonnage, they can do what they like. They can build more. But I don't know if they actually have the infrastructure to do it. But there again, this gives them the opportunity to build up their infrastructure. Now, please note, I'm avoiding very clearly the discussion of the Japanese economics. Because, honestly, economically they don't. Economically, the treaties have been a godsend to them because they've managed to allow them to focus in on constructing things and not, you know, building the stuff and not spending the money. There's also the other problem for the Japanese that they don't start recruiting till after they've built the ships. They don't increase the service personnel, the person they have in their fleet, until after they have new ships in service. They don't recruit for the ships coming in, they wait till they're built. But saying all that, this would undoubtedly lead to them having a larger naval aviation force, a larger battle fleet, a large cruiser fleet, a larger everything prior to World War II, which gives them a lot of a lot of strength. And World War II, as it happened historically, and please note, I'm not going to go into past 1936 in this scenario. I'm not, because I can see up to that point, but I can see a path, but I can't see what happens beyond that point. And there is a very big reason for this. If Japan is building more, Japan is going to feel more secure. 
that's going to lead to one of two things. Either their greater feeling security is going to lead to more confidence, which is going to lead to a very different approach to global relations. Or it's going to lead to them feeling stronger, yet still feel as insecure, which is going to lead to even more irrational actions. War is never a rational act, by definition, therefore. So, well, you can't really foresee. All you can see is that the Soviet Union is going to be building battleships. And that's going to be an interesting focus for the Japanese, especially when you consider, historically, there is a Russo-Japanese war which takes place prior in 1939. It's one of the reasons why the Japanese act the way they do with Britain in Tsingtao in January 1939, because they do have issues with the Soviet Union over China, and they don't want a war with Britain at the same time as the Soviet Union. Or at least the sum of their leadership doesn't. Uh, some of it's quite smart. And why the Soviets hold off invading Poland is because they're still uh, they're still sorting out the war with Japan at that point, and they don't want to start the war in the West. So they finish the war in the East because they don't want to be fighting on both fronts at the same time. Someone understood logistics and strategy. I'm not sure who that was. So the question becomes. What happens? I think if that war does happen as historically, you see a lot of Japanese naval technology gets te tested out on the Pacific Fleet if any of those ships exist. And that could well be an eye-opener to the Americans and the Brits on the Japanese capabilities. Because whilst, yes, there's probably going to be something like, oh, well, they, they sunk a Soviet battleship. They sunk a Soviet battleship. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's still going to be a case of, oh, yeah. While we're in the press, we're going to say, oh, it was a Soviet battleship. That's not the same as sinking ours. In reality, there's going to be a lot of work it's going to create and a lot of information it's going to generate. So, things would be interesting. I'm, of course, presuming they would sink a Soviet battleship in that scenario, but... I think it's fairly safe to assume that the overwhelming preponderance of Japanese firepower would be concentrated in the Pacific, whereas the overwhelming preponderance of any available Soviet power, of firepower would once again find itself on the other side of the world, and either having to make a voyage round, a la second uh, <laughs> run of the Battle of Tsushima, or would not. I'm hoping they'd be more sensible. Otherwise, you'd have a run again of the whole second Pacific, second and third Pacific squadrons, and the Battle of Tsushima again. And uh, no, surely no one would repeat that thirty odd years later. No one would repeat that thirty-four years later, would they? Please tell me. Comment below if you think they would actually repeat it thirty-four years later with like six battleships. Uh, I, I don't. I honestly don't think they would. The Soviets wouldn't do that. They wouldn't. So what does Germany do? Cry. Okay. In 1930, they are building Deutschland herself. They're not building anything else. They don't have the infrastructure or the stuff in place to build anything larger than Deutschland. That's what they're doing. That's the treaty allowance, and that's also what they're infrastructurally able to build. They are three years away from Hitler becoming Chancellor, four years away from him becoming Führer, and five years away from the Reichsmarine becoming the Kriegsmarine. This is not the German scenario that does anything good for them. If the British build new battleships, the, uh, the uh, French build new battleships, and the Soviets complete anything... That's going to completely change this German scenario. Remember, they're maxed out capability because of their infrastructure. And it's nothing to do with the naval treaties. It's entirely the damage wrought intentionally by the Treaty of Versailles, which has put them in that situation, means that they get three Deutschland class with their 11-inch guns. They get the roughly three of the Hippers in service at any one point with their 8-inch guns. They get the two Scharnhorse with 11-inch guns. I know they were upgrading nice now towards the end, but she never gets any service. And they get, at various points, either Bismarck or Tirpitz in service. Because by the time Tirpitz has actually it has not just commissioned, but has gone through all her post-commissioning trials and workups, Bismarck is sunk. Historically. That's not a good scenario for the Germans. In this scenario, the British have five probably fast battleships as well to back up 
already in service before 1913, uh, before uh, long with service before 1939. When they start building the ki the class after them, so let's say they've built the five king, they're called King George V. So let's say they go with that class name. Yay, they go with that class. The next, they're building the class after that already. They're building the next class after that. So they have worked up their infrastructure, all their industry, all those things have been worked back to the working pitch that they were by an earlier build. So that means the King George V are going to go faster than they did historically, or rather the ships in the timeline of King George V are going to go faster historically. So that means in 1939, the Germans could be facing the British with 10 brand new battleships. And all, a lot of their other ships modernized and upgraded. Fast battleships. It's a case of, it's not good for the Germans when they've got two Scharnhorst and they might have Bismarck or Turbots. And yes, you can say, well, they, they could build more. Yes, but any for, for the Germans, the problem is building more comes at the expense of their army and their air force. It comes at the expense of the, uh, the, uh, the Abwehr and the Luftwaffe. They're not going to they're not going to sacrifice those to build up the navy. So they're probably going to have to go a completely different naval route. And if they do anything, if they go, let's say, a submarine-focused navy or something like that, that's going to trigger other reactions. That's going to trigger the building of a convoy, a sloops or convoy escorts or all sorts of things. They go for quite a balanced approach, which causes the British most trouble to prepare for, because the British have to prepare for everything, historically. In this scenario, the British are already advanced enough that they don't have to worry about preparing for the capital ships. They don't have to worry about preparing for that. They're going to have them carriers in service. Maybe the Germans actually do build the Graf Zeppelin in this scenario. I don't know. But they don't have to worry about it as much. And that's really a problem for the Germans. I honestly do wonder whether they actually build a navy at all. I honestly, it, there, you, you, Hitler still might go around and go, yes, we want to build up our navy to be strong, but it's a case of you've got to match in against the Soviet fleet, which could have two, maybe three, maybe even four, because if any of their place is going to complete capital ships, it's going to be the Baltic. And remember, the, by 1939, the 19, and this is the 1936 London Treaty, I don't think would have happened. I don't think there's any treaty because there's enough, there's enough trying to they they're theoretically agreeing a treaty when Italy and Japan have dropped out. If the Soviet Union has dropped out as well, no one's agreeing a treaty. Okay, maybe Britain, France, and you know, uh, and America do try and do something, but it's going to be worthless. So by this point, the German, uh, the Soviets could have four brand new battleships sitting in the uh, sitting in the Baltic. You don't have to deal with that. Okay, you can go, well, air power is going to be a primary deal. And method of it. That's good, then invest in the air power. And one of the problems the, the Germans have is in the run-up to World War II, and for much of World War II, they have absolutely terrible aerial torpedoes. Terrible ones. I've done a video on that on when I talked about the Graf Zeppelin's aircraft, the torpedo bombers that would fly from it. That was done a couple of weeks back, I think. That was on the... Ooh... March, that would have been about the 8th of March, 2024, roughly, uh, that would have been. That's a video about the Fee-167 and the JU-87C. And they just don't invest, so maybe they change their investment strategy. There's all sorts of options they could go down, but they could also be just as bad as they were historically. They could be just as much of a really good on paper, really interesting ingredients, really bad and confused execution because you have so many people who are in, in the German system especially, so many people who are who think they're the chef in the kitchen, not the line cook. And the trouble is in the kitchen you need only what you only want one chef. When you're organizing that brigade, when you're getting the food together, there's got to be one voice, one certainty making decisions and the trouble for the Germans in a lot of their construction, a lot of their organization, there are many, especially when it comes to warships, there are many, many chefs who think it's their recipe the ship's being built around. It's just So what happens overall, all of this 
war could actually be both less likely and more likely. I think war in the Far East, there is probably a war between the Soviet Union and Japan in the late 1930s, as there was historically. I think that probably still happens on the timeline, and I think there's a right bum fight with that one. I think you probably end up with a European war at some point in the early 1940s. There is a real scenario for me as to how it happens and what exactly happens with it, because I think if Germany has chosen not to invest in a navy, the British might stay out. If it's a land war purely in Europe, the British might stay out. If Germany doesn't have a navy and is specifically hasn't built submarines and said we won't challenge Britain at sea, has gone that route, then Britain might stay out. Britain might not get involved. Because whilst theoretically they're tied to France, they find France annoying. In please make this point, it's not France as in the country or the people annoying. France is in the government's annoying. Honestly, the scenario which happens in 1940 is part of a long-running scenario of French governments randomly changing and completely changing their opinions on things, on the British government. One of the reasons which drives their reaction on Merz al-Kabir, etc., this is not a justification, but this is the thought process, is that they can't trust that the French government making the promises today is going to be the French government trying to deliver those promises tomorrow. And they have no idea who they're going to be, and they have no faith in them. Because they kept changing their opinions so often. And it's one of those things that, when you see Merzal like Kabir, etc., on those events, people take it as an insult to France, and the honor of France, and it's a case of, it's not France the country that's the problem for the British government. It's France's, France's governments, and the fact they've had not follow through. The people do follow through. The people are great. The governments, they've been an ongoing problem, for, as far as Britain's concerned, for the previous 20 years by this point. And I could see them not getting involved. I could also see that not being a sensible decision because of what well, Italy might well get involved. And if you've got a humbled France and you've got Italy and Germany stomping around Europe, that's eventually going to become a problem which Britain will have to deal with. And probably America will have to get involved in that too. But I would reckon before you got that, you'd end up with some sort of... The Soviet Union would win the war on land, as it did historically. They might well lose the war at sea, which would change some of the balance of power in Japan, which could lead to a very different conflict in the Far East, which is probably going to lead to an Anglo-American alliance, because neither of them, as I've said before in many other videos, can afford the other to be the one to humble Japan and therefore supply, take complete dominance of the Far East. They have to share it. So it doesn't matter which one the war starts with, the other one has to join in. That would be a major effort. And then I think after that, you might see the German-Italian alliance try something. Might. It might be just Germany. It might even actually just be Italy. It's, it's going to be interesting. It's going to depend on the scenarios and how it works out. Um, but I could honestly see it being very complicated and very different. I could also see it being a scenario whereby Mussolini falls from power after a war with France because feeling confident he decides he's going to try and do a Hitler and supplant the traditional power in the country, which is the monarchy, and is going to find out very quickly that whilst he claims to be a dictator, the fact that there are a lot of senators and members of parliament who regularly spend their entire time sessions insulting him and the armed forces might have a lot of his cronies in but they uh, they, they they also have a lot of people who admire his cronies but are actually members of the nobility and connected to the royalty first uh, i think he could end up finding himself out of position and that could then change things dramatically again it's it's a whole different world with this. Because you've changed the calculations quite so much. Because Germany feels they have a chance because everyone has been held back. At this point, you're starting the construction programs in 1930 and you're honestly starting them in 1930-31. 
Whereas Britain historically didn't actually start building up and preparing for war till 1937. So Germany starting when it did in 1935, that they felt gave them a chance and it did. Not a good one, but it gave them a chance. So you'd have, historically the British and Americans would have started their construction programs four or five years earlier than Germany. And that means there's no chance because they don't have to build up the infrastructure. They don't have to rebuild the infrastructure first. They have the infrastructure. They don't have to chain train new design teams. They don't have to get everyone built in, you know, in service. They have all those people already. They don't need to do that. And with the also the the difficulty of the Soviet Union, the strength of the Soviet Union also building up next to them, that provides a further thing the Germans have to build against. And think about. And let's be honest, the Deutschlands in this scenario don't work because the French have three fast battleships with 12-inch guns. The British have five fast battleships. You know, at that point, the three Deutschlands, there's raiding ships. There are that many carriers in the world, that many fast battleships, and renown repulse and hood yeah that's that's not a scenario those ships survive they get out they're not coming back it's going to be grass bay but far worse because those groups instead of being cruiser groups are going to have a fast capital ship with them and they're going to have a carrier with them which was the british plan and some of the groups hunting them did were that form they just weren't all over the world because they didn't have enough of them to be all over the world Add in five more and possibly five more cap fast capital ships and five possibly fast ca five uh, carry potentially five more carriers and suddenly you could be at least in three or four more places with such groups and yeah that that shrinks the world as far as those ships are concerned very quickly because if they want to be out they need to be taking out certain levels of trade and inf uh, certain levels of shipping routes which shrinks the world the oceans down quite dramatically because of where those shipping lanes are. And then to cover them when you have more ship and more battleships and carrier combinations, that shrinks it down even more. Shan horse class. Let's be honest, a couple of eleven in, of nine eleven inch gunned battle uh, fast battleships, but still, it gets just eleven inch guns versus ships which have nine sixteen inch guns. That doesn't match match up in the Baltic. Doesn't match up in any scenario. So for the Germans. The whole escalator of their build to build up their infrastructure, build up their knowledge, build up their development, and get to the building the Bismarcks. And the escalator now has no value. Those ships have no value. There is no scenario those ships use because they're, the sheer quantities now reigned against them. They can no longer outrun what they can't outfight. Or rather, they can't in outrun it enough to uh, enough what they can't outfight. So they're in real trouble. Soviet Union, they are a lot stronger. But they're also probably weaker in some ways. But there again, the sheer amount of infrastructure you actually would have to build to support and sustain these fleets could well give them other advantages when it comes to any conflict they define themselves in. They would probably have a redoubled and re-strengthened artillery arm, for example. Because of the amount of shell development work and the amount of barrel development work they would have to do. So they could have some really, really interesting pieces along their um, their borders when they start putting in their defensive positions. Anyway, I often finish these videos with a question and I'm going to chuck it in. Now, I've talked through what I think the British, the Americans, the Japanese, the Italians, and the French, and the Soviets do in this scenario, and the Germans. But I haven't talked about the minor powers, who might also do something. There are the Dutch, the Swedes, Spain, Brazil, Argentina, Chile. China. I know she's always being fought over and I know that the government in this period is really poster child for weak and ineffective. But there are there would be changes. 
in all this there will be changes. There's also a scenario which we have to consider of how does Bryn differentiate this force around in contrast to its dominions? Do they pick up some of the effort? I think Australia probably would, but I'm not sure if a Canada or a India picks up anything, mainly because of the British government in India being a bit weird whenever it comes to naval strength, because they are so obsessed with the British Indian Army. They do not want anything to detract from its preeminence. It, it's kind of like the Abwehr in Germany, but it makes less sense because... India has a, is, has a huge coastline as well and is hugely dependent upon mar movement of, tra of trade and goods by the sea. But we'll leave that to one side. So what do you think the minor powers and the dominions do? How much of the pie do you think they get? Because the British fleet will be, stra uh, will be stra uh, spread between them. I think, though, they will be getting British... Uh, it, it, I don't think they'll be building their own ships. Uh, unless they have a massive infrastructure of them. Again, you're not going to build a yard, upper yard, which is capable of building heavy cruisers when you're going to be building one heavy cruiser. The cost for the yard is massively outweighing the cost uh, of the ship, let alone the rest. However, maybe destroyer construction? Certainly sloop construction, if that's increased. And I could see that being increased as well. So it's, I'll be interested to see what people say. Thank you very much for watching and hope you enjoyed. If you liked the video, please like, share and subscribe. If you'd like to support more videos being made, there's Patreon up there where you can make suggestions for topics and vote on which topics. There is also membership in the channel and various other things. Thank you for everyone who supports the channel, super chats and super thanks and all those things because that allows me to buy the books and do all the, spend the time doing all this. So thank you very much for making it possible. And what do we have coming up this week? We have... Conception, operation, conclusion of the Kaiser Lika Marine's carriers, the seaplane carriers of World War One for the Kaiser Lika Marine. I hope it's going to be an interesting video. Um, it's certainly been an interesting thing to look into. It has been. And what's an interesting thing, because I had to pull out a load of research I did during my PhD thesis years ago. I went I almost shuddered at seeing my handwriting. It was terrible. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed.